I'm going to keep plowing through Matthew, section 6 of Matthew. And uh, this, of course, this section of Matthew is dedicated to his final visit to Jerusalem in the week leading up to his crucifixion. So uh, every, everything from toward the end of chapter 20 all the way to the very end of 25 is all one section in my reckoning of Matthew's outline. And I've titled this, Jesus Pronounces Judgment Against Israel and Its Leaders. And that is what he saw fit to do during his uh, last week leading up to his crucifixion. And we trust that that was what needed to be done uh, based on their response to him, their rather lackluster response to him and what they were planning to do. Well, in all of that, we've come to the final portion of section six. And this is what we call the Olivet Discourse. We, call it, we name it that from the Mount of Olives, just outside of Jerusalem, where Jesus was when he said these things in particular. This is a private sermon from Jesus to his disciples. This is Matthew 24 and 25, so the very end of section 6. And in this portion, Jesus predicts and describes the destruction of Jerusalem's temple, his second coming, and the end of the age. And we've made it uh, to the eighth passage of the Olivet Discourse, which we read last time. We'll go ahead and read it again this morning so we can have it fresh in our minds. This is Matthew 24, verses 36 through 41. It says, But of that day and hour no one knows, and he's speaking here of the coming of the Son of Man, so his return. But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, <coughs> until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then there will be two men in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. So according to Christ, no one knows the day or the hour of his return. He says that exactly as I worded it just now. He makes it very plain. In my previous sermon, I gave you a history of failed attempts to predict the return of Christ. And there are quite a few of them uh, kind of bunched in certain phases of church history, but there were quite a few efforts people have made to predict with some degree of accuracy the return of Christ, none of which have been successful. Um, my hope was to show you how sensible it would be if we were all to give up trying to predict the return of Christ in any measure whatsoever. Uh, certainly today's passage is primary, uh, really this next a uh, few passages, really, of the Olivet Discourse are primarily trying to get you to be always ready for the return of Christ, not trying to mark your calendar for some date that you can wait for and deal with Jesus later. You're supposed to be ready for him at all times. Uh, now, last sermon, I think, was very important overall, uh, but I have to admit I didn't really deal much with the passage in front of us, and so that's what I want to do today. I want to deal with the actual passage uh, that Jesus has laid out for us a bit more directly than I did last time. So today's sermon is called God Only Knows, simply because God only knows when Jesus is going to return, the way Jesus tells it here anyway. My outline for today has four headings, and I'll lay these out for you so you can see where we're going with what we're doing today. First, the Olivet Discourse proves that no one will ever predict the return of Christ. So we've proven that practically, so to speak, from last sermon, and now we're going to prove it more from the passage. Secondly, I'll make the argument that other scriptures are often misused in predicting the return of Christ. And this is where we get more into the mentality of the date setters and why they uh, think they have some kind of biblical warrant to do what they do. Thirdly, I'll show you the foolishness of predicting the return of Christ from a specific prediction. And basically, this is me. I want to go back to one of the ones I mentioned last time and give you more detail about how that argument was made, just so you can see the kinds of things they do. Uh, and I think that is helpful in its own way. So I want to do that today as well. And then finally, I'll observe that the Olivet Discourse 
gives us no signs to help us predict the return of Christ, which might land a little odd on your ears as you hear me say that, that the Olivet Discourse gives us no signs for predicting the return of Christ, but I will show what I mean by that when I get there. So for the most part, today's sermon is dedicated to the statement, again, of verse 36, that no one knows the day or the hour, uh, and everything else is kind of brought in to clarify that and establish that. Uh, but again, you know, verse 36 is really the centerpiece of what we're doing today. Now, Christians who are dismissive of this statement in verse 36 uh, usually make one of two replies to what Christ has taught us here. So if you're wondering what their general mindset is, I will tell you here at the beginning. Uh, some Christians reply, nobody knew the day or the hour back then, but now we can know when Christ will return. So their argument is kind of a that was then, this is now sort of argument. And then the other set of Christians reply a bit differently. They, uh, you might call this the technical answer because it's based on technicalities or semantics, if you will. They say no one can know the day or the hour, but we can still know the year and the month. It's like so being very, very uh, pedantic on the way they understand what Jesus is saying here. But whichever reply they make to this, you know, they are just flat out wrong, as I have already showed and as I will show again today in a slightly different fashion. Now, all of this, again, is a good lesson for the younger people here in particular. I remember directing uh, my last sermon specifically to you all as well. I'm going to do the same thing again, uh, just because I want you to know what to expect as you grow up and hopefully follow Christ. Uh, regrettably, not everyone who comes to you in the name of Jesus actually does what Jesus wants. Some of them are extremely wicked in the way they use the name of Christ. Some of them are just misguided, and that's probably more accurate for the kinds of people we're talking about today. But still, uh, not everyone is doing what Jesus wants us to do. And even people who think they're following Jesus aren't always doing so. And this is why we've made such a great effort here at this church to teach you the Bible, so you can see through some of that foolishness and uh, see through the people that wrongly believe they're doing what God is telling them to do, uh, who wrongly believe they're doing what God wants them to do, and uh, be biblical about these things. That's really what we're going for with all of this. So again, you know, today's sermon, I do sort of have the younger people in mind, but surely everyone here is somewhat interested in uh, these things, so uh, it really is for everyone too. So let's begin with my uh, first heading that I promised. For my first heading, I want to show you how the Olivet Discourse proves that nobody will ever predict the return of Christ. So really just focusing on this part of the Olivet Discourse. We can stay here in the surrounding passages and really see this. Starting from today's passage through the next several parables told by Jesus, uh, we can see that any effort to predict the return of Christ is contrary to what Christ taught. Uh, no matter how you want to try to get away from that, I think when you really look at the things Jesus says here, uh, really sway you away from making any kind of prediction. Now I have five observations to make uh, from these uh, passages here in front of us. To begin with the weightiest point, uh, these failed prophets try to learn what neither angels nor Christ know. Right, so I, I call that the weightiest point because we're dealing with, uh, well, to call angels and Christ and dignitaries it makes it sound a little bit uh, uh, reductionistic. I mean, they, they have glory beyond what we have. Certainly that is the case of Christ, but uh, also with the angels. We have a saying that fools rush in where angels fear to tread. And, uh, you know, that could be a description of anyone who tries to predict the return of Christ. Uh, in today's passage, we see that angels do not know when Christ will return, right? Even the angels of heaven don't know, according to what Jesus says here. But a whole crowd of fools have rushed in to try to learn what is too lofty even for angels to know. I mean, these are the ones who tend directly to God and serve him directly. They don't even know, and yet somehow we on the earth are going to figure it out. Uh, it doesn't seem logical to think that way. Nonetheless, people have tried but they're rushing in where angels fear to tread. But more than that, the failed prophets that I was talking about last time and their followers 
try to learn what even the Son of God did not know as he was sitting here talking about this, Jesus himself. Uh, people don't seem to realize that they're uh, charging into the most holy place when even the high priest won't enter there because that's who Jesus is. He is our high priest, and uh, there are places where only he can go, and if we follow typology, you know, even <laughs> there's even restrictions somewhat on that, right, based on the way the high priest operated, you know, back in the old tabernacle in the temple. And here we see kind of a piece of that. I mean, even the Son of God does not know the plan of his Father for his return. But here we are trying to, you know, dive into the most holy place ahead of the high priest, and do something he can't do. It seems like just the very wording here from what Jesus says should make us just say, ah, I'm going to keep my hands off this topic and just forget about trying to predict when Christ will return because the angels don't know and Jesus himself doesn't know. We should know our place, really, and you know, not try to learn what is even beyond our betters. And angels in Christ certainly are that, and we should not try to be greater than they are in this particular way that Jesus has laid out as a matter of ignorance among us. You know, this is not something we're going to be able to fix just by trying really hard. You know, that's really a, kind of a, a naive way of thinking about it based on what Jesus says here. Also, my second observation, if Christ is going to catch people by surprise, then even the year of his return has to be kept secret. And this is something that, to me, is just lying on the surface of the passage and should be like, you know, easy to get just by reading it. But this is something that a lot of people just don't get. In today's passage, Christ says that people are going to be going about their normal business right up to the time of his return. They're going to be eating and drinking. They're going to be marrying. They're going to be giving in marriage. Day, just ordinary life. You know, this is the stuff that life is made of. Eating and drinking are daily things. Marrying and giving in marriage are pretty common. All this is very just normal, very mundane. That scenario only makes sense if nobody knows when he will return, right? If no one is expecting anything out of the ordinary, right? Only then can they keep on with the eating and the drinking and the marrying and the giving in marriage. If people had any suspicion even if they only knew the year of Jesus' return, if that was it, if they narrowed it down to 365 days, even if they only knew that, they would spend that year doing nothing but preparing for his return, right? It, they'd be focused on that if people actually believed that. And we've seen this at different times in history. And maybe you caught references to this during my previous sermon when I was talking about these specific times when Christians were convinced that they knew when Jesus was going to return. The days leading up to that date are filled with people going so far as selling their homes, you know, donating money to ministries so they can spread the word, or doing street preaching of their own. I mean, some of this is pretty recent. Back in 2012, when one of these predictions was, a, was a in force, so to speak, there was a lot of that sort of thing. I mean, there was no, it wasn't life as usual. It wasn't eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. People were pretty on edge. But again, the whole point is to catch people by surprise so that while they're doing normal everyday things, Jesus shows up. That's the whole idea. And in order to catch everyone by surprise, as Jesus indicates, no one can know, not even the year. You can't even speak in such a general term as that. I mean, otherwise you spoil the surprise. And that's the whole idea laid out here for us. Furthermore, my third observation, the analogy with Noah proves that no one will have any warning. Okay? This is the analogy Jesus makes in the passage, as the days of Noah. That's what he says the coming of the Son of Man is going to be like. Now, you know, if you've read the book of Genesis, that Noah spent a long time building that ark. Uh, but uh, as time grew near, he, even he, even Noah, okay, only had seven days of warning as the flood drew near, as it actually got to, to D-Day, so to speak. And I just want to read this to you. This is just briefly back in Genesis chapter 7. To read verses 1 through 4, The Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and all your household. For you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. You shall take with you of every clean animal by sevens, male and his female, and of the animals that are not clean, two, a male and his female, 
and also of the birds of the sky by sevens, male and female, to keep offspring alive on the face of the earth. For after seven more days, I will send rain on the earth, 40 days and 40 nights, and I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I have made. So seven days prior to the flood, God told Noah to enter the ark. That's just, this is, remember, this is the go-to guy that God has chosen, Noah. He gets seven days warning for when it's actually going to happen, right? Now, during those seven days, Noah probably had no time to warn anybody either, because first of all, you see that seven days prior, God tells him to enter the ark. So he and his family, they're on board already. And as far as what they're doing in those seven days, they're probably getting all those animals ready because they've got a long time to wait on the ark uh, for all this stuff to go down. So there's no time for him to get out there and start warning people, hey, this is it. It's really coming, like I said. You know, who knows if they would actually listen to anyway, but the point is, they're not doing that. They don't have time for that. They are on board, getting ready and making ready. You know, just to read the rest of it here, starting in verse 5, Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded him, and Noah was 600 years old when the flood of water came on the earth. Then Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him entered the ark because of the water of the flood, of clean animals and animals that are not clean, and birds and everything that creeps on the ground. There went up into the ark to Noah by twos, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. It came about after the seven days that the water of the flood came upon the earth. And that is the analogy given to us by Christ over in the Olivet Discourse. In the analogy given to us, Noah had only seven days warning until doomsday, and even then he couldn't really warn anybody because he was busy doing other stuff. So for everyone else, there was no warning. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, and then they drowned to death. And there was no warning. That's it. And yet the failed prophets believe they can predict the return of Christ years in advance and give everybody time to prepare. When you look at the analogy given by Jesus, that's just ridiculous. I mean, that's not how the flood worked. I mean, there was no warning like that. I mean, there were seven days tops, and even then, only Noah's family knew that, and the animals, if you want to count them, you know, on the ark. Nobody knew anything to think that we can predict all that stuff years in advance is just absolutely contrary to what Jesus is saying here. Additionally, uh, to give my fourth observation, we will have no reason to be alert, as Jesus demands, if we know when he will return. And you've got to remember, this is the whole purpose. This is the so what of this passage. Just to read verse 42, I guess I didn't read it earlier, so I'll read it now. Therefore, right, this is the purpose of what Jesus is saying. Therefore, be on the alert. For you do not know which day your Lord is coming. That's the takeaway. Be on the alert. Now, as a rule, people are lazy until the last minute. That's just how most people are. There, is, there are a few go-getters among us, but for the most part, we like to put things off as long as we can. Right? Now, if people knew when Christ would return, even if they knew the year, they would be lazy about their souls until that time drew near. You really see people doing the same thing these days, even with death. You know, we all know we're going to die eventually, right? But people, a lot of people just live as though that's not really going to happen, and they just don't really give any thought to it. Well, same way with the, with the return of Christ. If they have any reason just to put it off, they will. And if they believe someone who says, yeah, Jesus won't return until September 23rd, 2033, or whatever, they're going to say, well, that's plenty of time. I can live however I want, and when that year comes, then I'll start making ready, then I'll repent and, and do all the, the God things I'm supposed to do. That's how people are. People are already very lazy about their souls, and they love any excuse they can get to be lazy about their souls. The thing is, Christ gives us no permission to be lazy ever, but he says we should be alert at all times because you don't know the day when he's coming. And that kind of mentality, if you hear that and if you believe it, that's going to make you get yourself ready. You're not going to be lazy because, after all, the end could come at any time. And that's the exact mentality he wants you to have. But you'd re you lose all of that if you can set a date for when Jesus is going to return. You're just allowing people to be lazy until then. <clears throat> that's exactly how it works. To be alert, we have to maintain the secrecy 
of when Jesus will return. Well, finally, I observe that date setting is self-defeating, as we can see from the parable of the thief that Jesus tells in a few verses here. <coughs> Just to read verses 43 and 44 here uh, following the passage. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. All right, now think about that. The Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. That's the general rule given to us by Jesus about when he's going to return. He's coming at a time when we do not think he will. Now, if that's true, then we know that he will never come at a time when a bunch of people are expecting him to come, right? That's the whole idea. The Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. So if God looks down at the earth and sees millions of people saying, Jesus is going to come back today, guess what? God isn't sending Jesus back that day because the whole idea is to send him back at a time when nobody expects, right? And that is why I call date setting self-defeating. If people honestly believe that, you know, 2033 or whenever, I keep giving that date, I don't know why, that's not a prediction, right? But if people honestly think that's the year, right, then everyone's going to be watching that year and God is going to say, oh, not this year. You know, that's the way this is going to work. You've got to realize he's coming at a time when we don't think he will. So if everyone's looking up at the sky, he's not coming back then. It's all self-defeating. So from all of that, these five observations, here from this passage and its context, here in the Olivet Discourse, we see that no one is ever going to successfully predict the return of Christ. You know, I suppose if you sat here and just started saying, he's going to come now, he's going to come now, and just like keep doing that the rest of your life, you'll eventually get it right, but most of us can't live that way, can we? <laughs> like that's the only way you're going to get it. That's the only way. Like, and that doesn't count, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> All right, so just take heed from the statements made by Jesus and just give up on the date setting. Now, <clears throat> we've got more to say on this topic. It's unfortunate that I can get two sermons out of all of this. But the fact is, the failed prophets never give up, right? And they're still at work. They've been at work. They're going to keep going with it, right? And usually, when they do this, they go to other scriptures to support the idea that they can actually predict when Jesus is going to return or predict anything else about the end times. And that's the, my second heading for today. I want to go to some of these other scriptures that they use. So let's go to these and let's see the kinds of arguments they make. Uh, because, again, you know, if someone opens a Bible and says something, you know, that's, that's worthy of consideration, not because they're saying it, but because they're going to the Bible but then you still have to look at what the Bible says and make sure they're understanding it correctly. So let's do that, let's be fair, and let's talk about some of these. I have three examples, I think, unless I've miscounted. Now, uh, some people refer to Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 5. Now, I'm going to quote this from the King James Version because the way it's worded is the way they typically use it. Um, so I want to, you know, read it the way they would use it. So Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 5. And I'll read just the verse first. So he says, Whoso keepeth the commandment shall feel no evil thing, and a wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. Now some Christians have supposed from this statement that a wise person can discern the time of the final judgment, which to me looks like a stretch already, uh, but nonetheless, that is the way they have understood uh, this statement. Now, it's a very narrow interpretation for such broad words as time and judgment, right? You can apply those to a lot of things, and to say that it refers specifically to the time of the end or the return of Christ, that's pretty narrow. Uh, so even that seems like a big stretch. Furthermore, the context, I think, really gets us thinking in a different direction. This statement is actually made in the context 
of keeping the commands of the king, uh, which means these judgments are more about wisdom in dealing with the government and uh, submission and things like that. Let's go ahead and back up and read verse 1, and we're going to read all the way through verse 7. <coughs> and let's just stick with the King James. We'll see how I do with this, right? I'm not typically used to reading from the King James Version. Who is as the wise man, and who knoweth the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom maketh his face to shine, and the boldness of his face shall be changed. I counsel thee to keep the king's commandment, and that in regard to the oath of God. Be not hasty to go out of his sight. Stand not in an evil thing, for he doeth whatsoever pleaseth him. Where the word of the king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, What doest thou? Whoso keepeth the commandment shall feel no evil thing, and a wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. Because to every purpose there is a time and judgment. Therefore the misery of man is great upon him. For he knoweth not that which shall be, for who can tell him when it shall be? Now, not only is that context, again, about dealing with the king, uh, which, again, kind of takes it out of the context of the end times and all that, but I can't help but notice that last part is about not knowing the future and how men can't know the future. Like, if they had just read two verses further, they might have thought differently about how they apply this verse. It seems very relevant for what we're discussing today. Uh, so overall, I really don't think Ecclesiastes 8 verse 5 is going to help people uh, justify trying to predict the return of Christ. So not that one. But what about other ones? Well, there's another passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 4. <coughs> I'll go there in a minute. So 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 4. And yes, here we are. So let's go ahead and read this. This is another passage very often misused by people who try to set a date for the return of Christ. I'm going to read 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 through 4. It says, Now as the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anyone, anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying, Peace and safety... Then destruction will come upon them suddenly, like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day would overtake you like a thief. <coughs> now, some Christians have gravitated toward verse 4, where Paul says that the day of the Lord will not overtake us like a thief. Right? So that's where they're focusing their attention. Uh, now, allegedly... The way the date setters and those kinds of people understand this statement, they say that the day will not overtake us like a thief because we know the day, right? You know, we, we know the time the thief is coming, and of course the thief represents Jesus because he comes like a thief in the night. Uh, but we know the day, therefore the day will not overtake us like a thief. And that's their way of viewing it. That's the way they very often talk about it. The problem with how they apply this verse is that they completely ignore the rest of what Paul writes. Let's start again in verse 4, and let's read down a little further into verse 6. It says, But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. Now, according to Paul, the reason that the day of the Lord will not overtake us like a thief is because we're staying awake. It's not because we know the day. It's because we're always alert in case today is the day. And this is exactly what Jesus is talking about back in the Olivet Discourse. It's about being alert at all times because any day could be the day. It's not because you know the precise day. It's because you're always on watch. That's the idea here. In other words, the analogy being used by Paul is therefore the same as the one used by Christ. Stay awake and be on the alert for the coming of the thief, meaning always be ready. So again, I don't think 1 Thessalonians 5 is going to help people uh, try to justify setting a date for the return of Christ. <coughs> I have one more passage for you. This one from Revelation chapter 3. This uh, verse has 
also been used sometimes to justify date setting. Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. This is the very beginning of one of these letters that John writes to one of the churches, the original recipients of the book of Revelation. Let's read chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. It says, To the angel of the church in Sardis write, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, and that you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die. For I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard, and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. Now, this is very much like the statements made in 1 Thessalonians 5 in the way they get abused by people, uh, who the date setters who try to set a date for when Christ will return. Allegedly, the way they understand the statement, <coughs> if the church of Sardis were to wake up, then Jesus will not be able to surprise them like a thief, meaning, allegedly, uh, that the church of Sardis will know the hour of Jesus' return if only they wake up. Right? So all they have to do is wake up, figuratively speaking, and then they will know the date of Jesus' return. But the answer to this is exactly the same as what I said about 1 Thessalonians 5, exactly the kind of comments I was making about the Olivet Discourse itself. It's all the same thing. Waking up is simply being on the alert always, so that you are anticipating the return of Christ at all times, so that you're always living in such a way as you need to live to be ready for his return. It's not about knowing the exact time, and the fact is you don't have to know the exact time if you're always ready. And that again is the purpose of statements like this, which I think again are very, very clear from the Olivet Discourse itself. So those are the kinds of passages where people go uh, trying to justify uh, the effort to predict when Christ will return. And it's a shame that in all these verses they go to they never got around to Acts chapter 1, which has another statement that I think is uh, very relevant for what we're talking about today. Uh, Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, which is, if there's any other passage that talks about this so directly, <coughs> this is the one. This is you know, just before the ascension of Jesus. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. The point being, don't try to know times and seasons. Just serve God. And that's the whole task we have been appointed to do as Christians. We're supposed to be his witnesses on the earth not trying to calculate when the kingdom is going to come and those kinds of things. That's not the point of what we're doing here, right? We're supposed to be serving God. So with that in mind, again, there's no real scriptural basis elsewhere for setting a date or predicting Christ's return. Now for my third heading, I thought it would be helpful uh, to show you uh, the foolishness of predicting the return of Christ from a specific prediction. Again, I gave you a lot of these last time, but now I want to give more detail. <clears throat> I want to actually go into the nuts and bolts of what one of these guys did on the occasion that he tried to predict the return of Christ and uh, give you some detail on that. And if I have any reason for this, I'll tell you what it is. Uh, some, when people come to you, there are, some people are like this. You know, Some people are kind of hard-boiled and skeptical like I am. But some people, if you come to them with an open Bible, they tend to believe what is said because, after all, the person's coming to them with an open Bible. And if they're going from this passage to this passage and all these different passages, it looks like they know what they're talking about. It's like, hey, they're preaching the Bible, right? And they've studied this a lot more than I have, so maybe there's some weight to it. Maybe there's some merit to it. I think a lot of people think that way, and so it can be easy to get overwhelmed by some of these guys when they come and start you know, going to all their passages to support their timeline for when Jesus is going to return. But really, 
it's not anything, right? It's not substantial at all. And it, it really becomes clear whenever the day comes and passes and Jesus hasn't returned. Uh, but to give you some help in advance, I want to show you what some of these arguments look like so that when you hear them, you're not so moved by them, right? And you just know, okay, this is the kind of things that other men have done. There's nothing to it. <coughs> All right, so the example I have chosen comes from the so-called ministry of Harold Camping. Uh, now, he has he had made two efforts, I believe, to predict the return of Christ. I'm focusing on the, uh, the one he set for 1994. So this is a long time ago for in some way of reckoning, right? Uh, so 1994, Harold Camping's effort to predict the return of Christ for that year. I want to go through his method so you can see the amazing leaps of logic and misuse of scripture, which characterizes date setting. So he begins his argument from Daniel chapter 12. And if you want to go to these passages, you can, but I'm going to be, I'm going to do exactly what they do and flip around the Bible rapidly uh, so that you can never get the context for anything. Uh, Daniel chapter 12, verses 8 through 9. <coughs> says, as for me, I heard, but I could not understand. So I said, my Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? He said, go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end of time. Now, according to Harold Camping, uh, the predictions of Daniel were going to be sealed from our understanding until the end of time, at which time our knowledge will increase enough that we will be able to know the date for when Jesus will return. So this is the way he handles this passage, right? You know, the, these things are sealed away until the end of time, at which point then we'll know things we didn't know before, including the return of Jesus. Now, uh, you can read Daniel 12 if you want to see if the return of Christ is anywhere in that context. Uh, nonetheless, uh, that is the way he actually applies this verse. Now, from there, he moves on to another passage, this one in Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, which I will read to you. This is where the Lamb uh, begins to unseal the scroll that figures so prominently there in the beginning of the book of Revelation, you know, the seven seals. And it's important to realize that Harold Camping identifies this scroll as the book of Daniel. Okay, So specifically, the Lamb is unsealing the book of Daniel, according to Harold Camping. Revelation 5, verses 1 through 5. I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was worthy to open the book or look into it. And then one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. <coughs> and of course, that, uh, that lion is Jesus, of course. But again, the way Harold Camping understands this, that scroll is the book of Daniel, right? And we see Jesus unsealing the book of Daniel, which is again what Harold Camping is talking about because remember, these things are sealed up until some later point, and then they're going to be unsealed for us, right? So that's how he understands all of this. Now, the big problem I have with this is it ignores some pretty strong contenders for identifying this scroll otherwise. Harold Camping says it's the book of Daniel, but there's other reasons to view it otherwise. For example, the description of this scroll as being written on the front and on the back uh, very much matches a scroll from a vision described from Zechariah in chapter 5 of Zechariah's book, in which he has a vision when he sees one of these scrolls, and it seems to represent the curse of God uh, when you read that passage back there. It sounds more like, to me, a reference to that. Or if not that, <coughs> there's another contender. The prophet Ezekiel has another vision in which he also sees a scroll in the hand of God, much like here, with writing on both sides, much like here, uh, in which he describes Ezekiel chapter 2 and 3. So if you were to go to Ezekiel chapter 2 and 3 of his book and read that, 
you'll see a vision that describes a very similar scroll. So rather than just coming here and saying, oh, it's the book of Daniel, it's like, how about paying attention to some of these biblical references that John seems to be making? He seems to be linking this vision to other visions that other prophets have had in which you know, God is sending forth his word through a prophet or through somebody and doing that kind of thing, you know, rather than just saying, oh, it's about the book of Daniel becoming intelligible to us at the end of the age. That's a really weak argument from Harold Camping. It does not contend with other scriptural details that might help us understand what John is actually writing here in the book of Revelation. However, let's roll with it, okay? Let's say that the, the, the sealed scroll here in Revelation 5 actually is the book of Daniel, and Jesus is unsealing it so that we can know the date of his return. Let's just say that's right. Harold Camping then makes a complicated argument from the breaking of the seventh seal. So we jump down now in the book of Revelation to chapter 8, verse 1. Get ready for this, okay? Here he says, When the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. Right? I mean, you see the point already, don't you? I mean, it's clear, right? Silence in heaven for a half an hour. Okay, so Harold Camping notes that in Luke 15, there is rejoicing in heaven when sinners repent, right? So in heaven, there's a bunch of noise, like joyful shouting when a sinner repents. But here, there's silence in heaven for about a half an hour. He therefore argues that when the seventh seal is broken and the book of Daniel is fully unsealed, it's going to happen at a time when nobody or very few people are repenting, right? Because, hey, when there's repentance, there's rejoicing in heaven. If there's silence in heaven, there must be nobody repenting. So when the book of Daniel is fully unsealed and open for us to understand, it'll be at some time when nobody is really repenting and following Jesus. So <clears throat> that's how he understands that. And as for when that happened, Harold Camping says that the book of Daniel was fully unsealed on May 21st, 1988. I don't know why, okay? I don't. Like, for some reason, out of... Why that date? I don't know. I'm sure, you know, maybe it was a very dark time spiritually. Yeah, maybe there weren't a lot of people repenting. Maybe churches had low attendance or something. But that's really precise. I mean, really precise. And there have been other phases in history where it seems like people have been spiritually slothful and people have not really repented. You know, that's why we have the contrasting phases of time, the Great Awakenings and the Revivals where people seem to be more interested. It's like to focus in on May 21st, 1988, as the half an hour when there, was a, when there was silence in heaven and nobody repenting, that is a huge stretch on his part. Uh, nonetheless, that's what he goes with for when the book of Daniel was unsealed. So if you were lucky enough to be alive on May 21st, 1988, you could read the book of Daniel and figure out when Jesus was going to return. Now, as for that, he still needs to show us from the book of Daniel why uh, it tells us when Jesus is going to return. And for that, he goes back to the book of Daniel, of course, Daniel chapter 8 this time. There we go. Daniel chapter 8, verses 13 through 14, which is now unsealed before his superior insight. Daniel 8, verses 13 through 14 says this, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that particular one who was speaking, How long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply, while the transgression causes horror, so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled? He said to me, For 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. <clears throat> and somehow Harold Camping reads that and believes it refers to the date when Jesus will return, which he calculates from May 21st, 1988, adds 2,300 days, and comes to September 6th, 1994, as the date when Christ would return, which did not happen, in case you didn't pick up on that already. We're all still here doing what we normally do, eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. We're all still doing the same stuff. So look, a lot of leaps of logic there. 
<coughs> now, it's easy to look back on that because it didn't happen, right? Because 1994 came and went and Jesus didn't return. It's easy to look back on that and see how it's a bad argument because after all, that conclusion was plainly wrong. But imagine you were hearing this in 1993 and here's a guy coming to you with the Bible. He's making all kinds of connections between passages. You know, he seems to know more than you do on this topic. You might find that really convincing. You wouldn't know you were wrong until 1994. That kind of thing could happen, right? And the way to uh, avoid that is just to remember this. You know, this is the kind of argument these guys make. If you hear somebody else making that kind of argument, I'm telling you, it's going to turn out the same way it turned out for Harold Camping in 1994, the same way it turns <laughs> out for all the other date satyrs. They're going to be wrong <coughs> every single time. So just because people are barraging you with scriptures and you know, making comments about them, that doesn't mean they're right. It takes more to be biblical than just quoting the Bible. Okay. Now, one more thing to do today before we're done with this. I want to uh, make the observation that the Olivet Discourse gives us no signs to help us predict the return of Christ. Now, I'm coming around to this uh, to comment on, you know, there, let me just put it this way. It's right to be at, right, it's understandable that you would ask for signs about the, you know, to predict the return of Christ because that's how the Olivet Discourse begins. In all three versions of the Olivet Discourse that we have, it starts with the disciples asking Jesus for a sign of some sort. They come to him asking that kind of question. <coughs> and in this, the disciples kind of set the trend for Christians of all the following ages, right? Because we too often ask, what are the signs? You know, how are we going to know when Jesus is going to return? And that's really, that's really what date setting is all about. And even if we disagree with date setting, we might think, you know, even if we can't be precise, surely there's going to be some warning, some warning sign that maybe we could keep our eyes open for. And by that, maybe we can know that Jesus is about to return. Forgive me, my voice is starting to give out on me. <clears throat> so you might think, well, surely there are some signs we can know that might help us get a ballpark figure or at least some advance notice before Jesus shows up. Amazingly, Christ gives no sign for his return in the Olivet Discourse. Even though the disciples start off asking questions like that, he gives no sign. <coughs> in Mark's version of the Olivet Discourse, the only times he mentions a sign is when the disciples ask for one and when Jesus talks about the signs of the false prophets for himself, for his own coming, for anything God actually does, no signs are mentioned in Mark's version of the Olivet Discourse. <coughs> in Luke's version, we might think that we're going to get something because he does mention signs in the heavens before the return of Christ. What we got? Oh, we got a cough drop. Fantastic. Ricola. Ricola. I don't have the advertisement for them. Thank you. So anyway, Luke actually does mention something about signs in the heavens before the return of Christ. I just want to read that to you. Luke 21, verse 25 through 28. There will be signs in the sun and moon and stars, and on the earth dismay among nations, in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Now that sounds like, hey, there's some signs there. Signs in the heavens, using that word, signs. And other things that might give you some advance warning here. However, we've got to remember something. Luke also mentions heavenly signs alongside the events which are not signs of the end. <coughs> and if you back up, you'll see when he gives his description of the birth pangs that I've already talked about in Matthew. 
he mentions the same kind of thing. He, this is Luke 21, verses 10 through 11, by the way. He continued by saying to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places plagues and famines. And there will be terrors and great signs from the heaven. Now, as I commented way before in the Olivet Discourse, cough drop in the mouth now. <clears throat> it's not one thing, it's another, isn't it? Okay, um, so the birth pangs that I talked about, these are things that are going to character, these are the normal recurring problems of history, as I've argued, you know, months ago. But part of that is signs in the heavens. You're going to see stuff, you know, comets and asteroids and whatever, supernovas and all that. The thing is, if that's characterizing the entire phase of history from Christ onward, they're not really good signs for the return of Christ. You know, you're going to have signs in the heavens as part of the ordinary birth pangs. You're going to have signs in the heavens leading up to his return. It seems like it's going to be kind of seamless. So, yeah, everyone's worried and trembling and all that, but people are always doing that. Do you read the news? <coughs> people are always worried about something. And now every so often people say Jesus is coming back and gets everyone all worked up. <coughs> so in any, what I'm trying to say there is the way Luke words that in both parts of the Olivet Discourse, it's not really helpful as a sign. You're not going to be able to pay attention to the sky and you know, get clued in on when Jesus is going to come back. It's all going to blend together. So that doesn't help. So what about Matthew? <coughs> Are there any signs in Matthew in his version of the Olivet Discourse? Now, Matthew's gospel is the only gospel in which the disciples ask in particular for a sign of his coming. In the other two, they ask for, you know, the, the signs of when these things will take place. But here they're more exact. In verse 3 of Matthew 24, Then tell us when will these things happen, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So they're very precise. They are asking for the exact thing that Christians have wanted so badly over the course of our history. They want a sign to tell us when Jesus is going to return. They are particular about this. So if any of the Gospels is going to give us a sign to help us predict the return of Christ and be able to say, when you see this, you know he's about to come back. If any Gospel is going to do that, it's going to be the Gospel of Matthew. And yet he does not, the Gospel of Matthew does not give us our answer. Matthew has the birth pangs, but he says that is not yet the end. Matthew describes the abomination of desolation, but that is only a sign for the downfall of Jerusalem and its temple. Matthew describes signs being performed by false messiahs and false prophets, but that's no help because they're false messiahs and false prophets. The closest we get to a sign is Matthew's unique expression, the sign of the Son of Man. Verse 30, he says, And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. But what is the sign of the Son of Man? He doesn't really say what it is, right? Right? Now, I took a guess at this at an earlier sermon. I gave my opinion that it's based on something Isaiah says about the Messiah being a signal or a standard for the nations, <coughs> so that when he comes, he will gather the nations together. I made that argument, and I believe that argument, and it does seem to fit the overall context, but as a sign to help us predict something, it's not much. It really sounds like the Son of Man is his own sign. So good luck using that to predict anything. You'll see it when you see him, basically. When you actually see the Son of Man coming, you'll see the sign of the Son of Man. And you'll see him gather the nations. That's about it. I mean, that's, there's your sign. That's it. Now, all that to say, look, even if we reject the whole date setting thing and we kind of lay aside the idea of setting a year or a particular date, we have to also give up the idea of having any kind of advance notice. There's not going to be any kind of sign. <clears throat> oh my goodness. People get some funny ideas on this. I remember in high school at some point, it was during one of those times when the 
preachers get everyone all worked up because people were shooting guns in the Middle East and all that. And some kid at school asked me, what are the seven signs of the apocalypse? It's like, no, just no. The, the answer to your question is no. That's not how this works. There's not a list of signs you can be watching for. The whole idea is to be alert at all times so that you don't need signs. You're just always ready. You have to keep that mindset. <coughs> now on that, I want to read a final passage to you. This is from Mark's version of the Olivet Discourse. Mark 13, verses 32 through 37. I consider this very important, especially the last part. Okay, it's very similar to what we've seen in Matthew, but the way he ends it, I think, is really important. But of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Take heed and keep on the alert, for you do not know when the appointed time will come. It is like a man away on a journey, who upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge, assigning to each one his task, also commanded the doorkeeper to stay on the alert. Therefore be on the alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, in case he should come suddenly and find you asleep. What I say to you, I say to all, be on the alert. <coughs> what I say to you, I say to all, be on the alert. Now I find that last statement especially helpful for today. What Christ said to his first disciples, he says to all of his disciples, even us. There's none of this, that was then, this is now kind of thing. I mentioned that as one of the ways people try to get around that statement. They're like, oh yeah, back then nobody knew the day or the hour, but now we can know. Uh-uh. What I say to you, I say to all. What Jesus said to that group of 12 men right there on the Mount of Olives, he says to everybody, that's you right here, be on the alert. It's not about finding the right date and marking it on your calendar and goofing off until then. You got to be always ready for the master of the house to come home so you can open the door for him. That's the idea. Always ready, always watching. Now, next time when I teach, I'm going to be talking about that in particular, the unwavering watch of the Christian and how this is supposed to characterize the entire Christian life. So I've got more to say on this, but a bit more of an applicational sort of thing, I hope. We'll see how it turns out. But that's the idea, always watching, not trying to set a date, not looking for signs, but always watching. Now to that end, I've gone through all of this to try to make this argument for you. First of all, I pointed out to you some details from the Olivet Discourse about how no one is going to be able to predict the return of Christ. I took you to several verses throughout here from what Jesus says. I then went to several passages that often get misused by the date setters as they try to justify their attempts, and I showed you how they're misusing those scriptures. I took you into a specific example from Harold Camping about how he uses scriptures to do what he does, and you know it was obviously wrong, but that kind of thing, you will see it again. And I don't want you to be overwhelmed by it, uh, because now I have warned you about it. I've showed you how it works. I've showed you how they use the Bible and how bankrupt it is. And then finally, I just observed that there are no signs really given to us in the Olivet Discourse to help us predict when Jesus is going to return. You just have to always be ready. <laughs> and that is the whole point of these things. So next time, we'll get more into that and the unwavering watch of the Christian and we'll talk about that. Until then, are there any questions or comments on what I've said today?